So, what an amazing time it is to be a Spider-Man fan. See what I did there? We have Spider-Man No Way Home coming out in December, and we just saw the trailer for Insomniac Spider-Man 2. So, I thought it's pretty much a better time as any to write the Spider-Man villains. Mind you, these are the live-action Spider-Man villains. So, Into the Spider-Verse, I'm not gonna be rating those, so... Sorry, Spider-Verse fans, but I just... Uh, it's whatever. This is how I'm going to rate them. Amazing is obviously top tier, and stupid is bottom. I'm going to be rating the villains based on, you know, what they did in the movies, their motivations, and pretty much overall, how they impacted the live-action movies. Also, another thing, mind you, this is just my personal list, obviously. Um, don't, you know, take it with a grain of salt. There may be some things you might like, some things you'll be surprised about. One thing I should mention before I get started, minor villains that only showed up for like about a minute or two and then completely left the movie or just went off screen or haven't become their super villain personas yet. I'm not counting those. So people like Scorpion and I guess Shocker, debatably, I guess they're not going to be a part of this either. So it's just the main important villains. The ones that actually have a movie revolve around them as the antagonist. So I'm just letting you know. Alright. Now I can get started. In the stupid tier, we have the Rhino. And obviously this is from Amazing Spider-Man 2. Nobody's surprised about this. Uh, Rhino. Let's see. What do I not like about this character? Uh... He's at the very end of the movie, and he's at the beginning of the movie. That's pretty much it. The, like, <laughs> you would think, to anyone who hasn't watched Amazing Spider-Man 2, you would think that I'm skipping some details, but no, that, that's just literally it. He shows up in the beginning of the movie, stealing some Oscorp plutonium, and then gets arrested. The whole movie goes by. And then for like the last two minutes of the movie, he shows up as the Rhino. And not only as in the, you know, like the comic book counterpart where he's actually in a Rhino suit. No, he's in a Rhino mech suit. So, I'm not saying that that's an issue. But let's be honest, he kind of didn't have to be in that movie. So, that's that. I think that's about it for, for Stupid Tear if I'm being honest. All right, moving on to the bad tier. Let's see. What is a bad villain? I'm not gonna lie. No one else is surprised about this. We have the amazing Spider-Man's version of the Green Goblin. Now, here is my issue, right? Here is my issue with this version of the Green Goblin. For people who who not only watch the Sam Raimi movies, but people who watch comics or read comics in general, or watch the, the cartoons, everyone knows that the Green Goblin is crazy, right? He's supposed to be a madman, but not an insane villain. You know, insane is like Cletus Cassidy, like Carnage, but I'm talking about, like, the, the kind of crazy that I'm talking about is the type of crazy where he would be considered a mad genius. Harry Osborn, right? Not only is he showing up in the movie, I want to say about a quarter of the way in. So The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is about two and a half hours. And his character development takes place, I want to say about probably for half of that for half of that time which you know you would think that there are other villains that have character developments with you know with, with more with slightly more time and that they do better but the problem is is that not only is it harry osborne getting a character development but so is electro so you're balancing two characters well three if you count spider-man and gwen stacy and their romance so that's technically four characters. But not only is the movie trying to balance out those three things, you all you have to make it at a certain pace so that it makes sense. You could take your time if you're guaranteed a sequel 
or if, you know, you have plans for a sequel, like the other Harry Osborn, the, you know, the other goblin in the room. But this character is just... On one hand, I want to say it's understandable, but on the other hand, it's just bad. Because Harry Osborn shows up like about a quarter of the way in the movie, right? A quarter or halfway in the movie. And all of a sudden, he's told by his father, and he's told, guess what? Um, you're dying. Uh, because I'm dying. I've managed to survive about, what? I want, I, I want to say Norman Osborn has survived about... 17 to 18 years? I don't I don't know how old Spider-Man's supposed to be in this movie. I want to say 18 years. We're, we're just going to ballpark it and say 18 years. Norman Osborn has survived this Osborn curse for 18 years. And Harry just shows up in the movie and he's like, oh, guess what? Um, Because you're, you know, because of plot reasons, your disease is accelerated by like three times faster than what mine's was. So you're dying pretty much real fast. You're dying faster than I ever did, so good luck with that, I'm out. And, you know, Harry is trying to find a cure for this. And for some reason, he just thinks, you know what? I need Spider-Man's blood. Because my corporation was working on spiders. He's a spider-based hero. Man, let's be honest. Let's be honest, he, he's probably the cure, he's the reason, he's the key to my survival. Which is like, okay, that logic kind of makes sense, but there are other facilities, other corporations that are working on spiders. It's not just Oscorp, but okay. Has a chat with Spider-Man, Spider-Man says, look bro, I want to help you, but I can't because it's too dangerous, which is stupid in and of itself, but you know what, we're not talking about that. And then, he finds out that there have been some, some, and some spider venoms in Oscorp's basement, injects himself, and then he turns into the Green Goblin. Turns into the Green Goblin. Randomly wants to, you know, kill a Spider-Man for rejecting to give him his blood. And then finds out Spider-Man's Peter gets his ass handed to him. And is the cause of Gwen Stacy's death. You see, like, recapping it out loud, you would think that I'm skipping some stuff. The problem is I'm not. I could go into further details about how, you know, he becomes the, you know, the, 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 the CEO of Oscorp and how, you know, his own company betrays him. But the, but the thing is that that's kind of irrelevant, though. It's kind of irrelevant because the, the main storyline of Harry Osborn in this movie is that he's dying. You know, he's dying to an unknown disease. It's genetics. And he just becomes a Green Goblin because of that. He's not stupid like the Rhino, but my lord, they could have just brought him in for Amazing Spider-Man 3. Just saying. Moving on, um, I'm gonna put an Electro in here. It's, it's just no surprise that the Amazing Spider-Man uh, villains are just bad. They're just bad, and, and it's such a shame. It's such a shame. But, um... Pretty much, Electro's whole gist is that, you know, he, he's a nobody. He slaves away at Oscorp, he makes a power grid, and, you know, he just... He's, he's just a random nobody. No friends, no contact with family whatsoever. And then, Spider-Man saves his life, and he just has this unhealthy obsession after that. After that, he just has this delusion thinking, Oh yeah, me and Spider-Man are best friends, man. Saved my life, you know. He says I'm his eyes and ears. Me, the one New Yorker, out of millions of other people, I'm special. And then all of a sudden, on his birthday, he's he's told to fix an electrical problem. Falls in to a, a vat of eels, gets superpowers that fix his teeth. I forgot to mention that he has gap teeth in this movie. Electro has gap teeth, and the eels magically fix the gap in his in his teeth. I don't want to say that's the dumbest thing ever, but in the context of this movie, it kind of is dumb. Like, the whole gap teeth shouldn't be a thing. Um, 
you know, at first he's scared. You know, he's scared that he has these new powers and that, like, he he's all of a sudden, like, need... He has the need to feed on energy. And then Spider-Man's like, come on, man, just, just stay with me. And then Electro gets shocked. Or, not shocked, he gets shot at. And then he's like, fuck everything, I'm pissed. And the thing about it, too, is that when Electro becomes his supervillain persona, you kind of feel bad for him, in a way. Because... For his entire life, he's just been used and manipulated. And then even when, and, and like the only time where he gets quote unquote a real friend, which is, you know, Harry Osborn because he frees him from his prison cell. It's, it, it's, it's kind of sad because I guess in, in one of these moments where Harry's like, I need you, you know, he's screaming out at the top of his lungs like, I need you. Electro's like, you need me? Like, it's a new feeling for him. It's a new experience that he's never, you know, that he's never been through before. So, actually, no. Now that I think about it, Electro's not a bad villain. He's a mid-tier villain. He's not good, but he's not bad. He's in the middle. The only reason why I can see some people calling him a bad villain is because if you if you haven't rewatched the movie, you would briefly recap like, oh, you know, uh, he, he becomes a supervillain because Spider-Man doesn't remember him. That's not really the case. He becomes a villain because of pretty much the fact that he just sees Spider-Man as like, oh, you know, like, the, the whole world sees me. But then, because Spider-Man's there, you know, like, like he, he's just, he's just a liar. He's doing it for the attention. To everything, it's all just fun and games, you know? He never takes anything seriously. So, that's how I interpret it. Again, this is just my opinion. Um, so yeah, Electro gets his ass handed to him eventually, and yeah, he just gets blown up. He, he just dies. I assume he dies, but seeing as how he's just pure energy, he literally cannot die. I think, but that's it. Alright, you know what? Next up, we have Venom. Venom... I'm not gonna lie, oh god, Venom, oh my lord, what did they do to Venom? My issue with Venom is the fact that he becomes Venom on the sole premise that, you know, he in, in his mind he's like, man, I hate Peter Parker. He goes to, okay, Eddie Brock works for the Daily Bugle, right? He, he's pretty much the, the, um, he's the freelance guy, right? Freelance taking pictures of Spider-Man. And he's trying to get the job, right? Because he he intends to marry Gwen Stacy in the Sam Raimi movie, Spider-Man 3, right? And so, uh, J. Jonah Jameson's like, look, whoever can get me pictures of Spider-Man to show that he's really a villain, I'll pretty much, you know, give you the, the job. I'll give you a staff job. Pretty much, um, with this in mind, right? What Eddie does in order to secure this, to secure his spot in getting that job, is he pretty much um he pretty much edits a photo of spider-man which makes it seem like he was robbing a bank and doing so he gets exposed by peter right he gets exposed to like oh check your editor next time because you know tell him to check his fucking source because the bitch was photoshopping these pictures and then he gets fired so he loses his he loses the job he loses his girl because you know peter's like haha i'm gonna fuck your girl now and he walks into a church you know he goes to church and he's like dear god please uh please kill peter because he's such an asshole and then he gets the black suit you know he gets the symbiote becomes venom and then he's like you know what you ruined my life now i'm gonna ruin yours and then he dies. You see what's the problem here? He blames Spider-Man for his own fuckery. He knew what he, like, Eddie knew what he was doing was wrong. And yet he's still like, you know what, man, I need this job. Let me just Photoshop a picture of Spider-Man and I'm good to go. I'll get this job in no time. I'm going to start making bread. Like... He even knew what he was doing was wrong because when Peter confronted him, he said, Please, don't, don't do this. Please, I'm, I'm begging you. I will lose everything. No one will hire me. And then what does Peter say? He says, get fucked. <laughs> so, 
So, so like, he blames Spider-Man for his own fuck-ups, you know? And it's like... Uh, what? Like, I, I, I don't understand the correlations. I'm pretty sure if you were in Peter's shoes, and you found out that Peter, you know, photoshopped a, a fake picture, you would call him out on it. Like, the fuck? So, yeah. Venom's just a bad villain. Like, I, I understand in the show, you know, in, in the shows and in the comics, you know, Eddie... You know, th there have been many iterations of how Eddie gets the black suit. One of which is, I guess, is more the iconic way where Eddie pretty much calls out, like, he puts it on the news, on the Daily Bugle, that this particular person is a supervillain or something like that. I forgot what his name was. Or that, like, he was responsible for the kidnappings. I don't remember what it was. And then Spider-Man caught the real, the, the real kidnapper or the real villain. And so, you know, it was because of Eddie's fuck-up that he also got kicked out of the Bugle. And then in another iteration, like Spectacular Spider-Man, um, you know, he lost his job, not because he fucked up or anything, but because Kurt Connors had the, the symbiote in, like, a specimen, you know, glass casing. And, you know, they, they got approved of a grant to study it. And so they hired Eddie to pretty much, you know, be an assistant. The problem was, um, when Black Cat tries to steal the symbiote and fails, the symbiote actually stays on Peter. And because the symbiote went missing, you know, they lost the fundings, you know, the, the Connors lost the fundings to study the, the symbiote, so they had to let him go. So it wasn't because Eddie fucked up, it was just because they lost funding. And then what made him hate Spider-Man was the fact that he Spider-Man tried to destroy the symbiote after, you know, taking off the black suit and whatnot. So, you know, there are many iterations of how Eddie gets the black suit, but the problem is this is just one of the dumbest ways that he got in it. Or, or one of the dumbest ways how he hates Spider-Man. Yeah, that's about it for bad tier. For mid tier, right, I just want to add one more, or two more people. First off, Mysterio. What do I have to say about Mysterio? Mysterio suffers one of the... Like, I, like, if it wasn't for this one thing, Mysterio would be on the good tier. But the problem is, just like his other counter... You, you know, just like his other villain in the MCU, he suffers from this dumb... That, like, it, it's been memed to death so many times about his motivations as to why he became Mysterio. But man, th this honestly kills, you know, it kills the fan inside me that this is the reason he becomes a villain. Um, so Mysterio becomes a villain because of Tony Stark. We all, we all know this, right? And his reasoning is dumb. He, he pretty much invented a holographic program. And, you know, it's, it's the hologram program that we saw in, you know, in a Captain America Civil Civil War. And the problem with that is Mysterio has always been the quote the master of illusions, but it's really just advanced tech. So at least they got that part right. But the fact that he has beef with Spider-Man, you know, with Tom Holland's Spider-Man, is because well, Tony Stark didn't think my invention was good enough, and he nicknamed it Barf. So because of that, fuck Tony Stark. And I found out that he has a satellite that he gave to a kid. That's mine. That's rightfully mine. And so, because of that one concept, it it just it just brings him down a tier. But after that, Mysterio is like a really good villain. But you know, th there are a lot of things that I like him. You know what? Wait, Mysterio is above Electro. That's a, that's just a fact. I forgot to fix that. But, um, the, the, the thing about Mysterio is that Mysterio has always been one person. You know, he's always been the one planning, setting up the tech and whatnot. But for the MCU to actually make it a team that, you know, a, a team for Mysterio, that's actually a really smart idea. The fact that Quentin Beck isn't the person, you know, he is Mysterio, but in a way he's not the only person who's considered Mysterio because he has a whole team behind him. I really like that. 
they even got people, you know, minor characters from other MCU movies. Like, um, that one scientist who was getting yelled at from, um, you know, from Obadiah Stane when he was saying, Tony Stark was able to build this in a cave with a box of scraps. You know, that guy, you know, that, that was actually pretty clever. And the fact that there are other people, like there are other tech geniuses who are able to fake the impulses and, you know, that, that there was another person who was coming up with the background for the, you know, for the multiverse hero that that is the story behind Mysterio and another person who's just um you know who makes the costume like that that's all really good that's what I really like about Mysterio in this even though the trailer tried to make it seem like he was an actual hero we all knew in the end that like his whole shtick was illusion deception so nobody fell for it you know except you're one of the schmucks who just got into you know comic books superhero movies and whatnot but yeah, Mysterio, uh, aside from the whole Tony Stark, uh, oh yeah, the one thing too I forgot to mention, oh man, I might have to move him up to a good tier, I might have to, because the one thing he did do, like, as a, as like his last trump card, is he exposed Peter's identity to the whole world, and that's always been in the department of Venom, because he's always done that, you know, he always runs his mouth like, oh, we know who you are, you know, like, we know you're Peter Parker and whatnot, we're gonna tell everyone. But the fact that Mysterio actually managed to do this and die as a martyr, it's kind of, it's really, it's really good. Not to mention, that's the whole reason why we're having No Way Home. So, yeah, he, he's gonna stay mid-tier. I would put him in good, but he's gonna have to stay in mid. Next villain in the mid-tier is Lizard. Uh, Kurt Connors lost an arm. I forgot how he lost it. I'm pretty sure, or I'm just pretty sure he was born with only one arm. I don't remember. But pretty much, scientist with one arm who has the obsession of regrowing lost limbs, right? His main motivation is that he wants to better further humanity, so he invents a serum that houses lizard DNA so that humans can regrow, um, regrow lost limbs. And then the massive side effect is that he turns into a lizard. Aside from the fact that he looks like a Goomba, which haha, everyone's made that joke at some point. Um, his whole motivation, like his whole end game goal, is pretty much kind of twisted in a way because not only is the not only is the serum imperfect, you know, it's un, is incomplete with a massive side effect. He just says, oh yeah, being lizards? Yeah, man, that's that's the next step in evolution, bro. It's the best thing ever. And it's like, okay. Okay, like, you you, you had me at first. But the next step in evolution? Forcing people to turn to lizards against their own will? Like, believe it or not, Lizard is actually one of Spider-Man's best villains. In my opinion. One of the best. Not the best, one of the best. Because he, he has done a lot of fucked up shit. The reason why I put him in mid-tier is because he kind of just has a straightforward goal, you know? It, it's not... Like, in a way, it's just... I don't know. I don't know, like, I, I guess it's just too plain. Kurt Connors and the Amazing Spider-Man just wants to turn everyone into lizards because... Apparently lizards are just perfect. And that's about it. That's about it. He was gonna transform the city into lizards, which I guess is cool. And I'm pretty sure he would have gone for the entire world. But let's be honest, by the time there was a whiff of news, a whiff of news that, you know, New York City was turned into lizards, the government would have nuked the city if it was if it was deemed, you know, uncontrollable. So I don't know. To me To me it's like I don't know. The the this version of the lizard is just not really good. Even though he has the same motivation that you know other villains have. Oh no no. The okay. Lizard is sort of he's on the borderlines now that I'm thinking about it. He's on the borderlines of being a bad villain. Simply because his motivation is just too simple. And I'm not saying, like, villains have to have, like, a grand scheme of things. But I want it to make sense, you know? Seeing as how 
He just wants to turn everyone into lizards because he believes that's the best way to help humanity. What are you going to do after that, you know? Whenever you have Kurt Connors as the main villain, you already know he's going to turn into the lizard. You already know that his motivation is going to be the lost arm that he has, you know, or that he doesn't have. My bad. No, I, no, I gotta make him. I gotta go. I, I, ha I just have to make him in the bad villains tier, dude. Like, now that I'm thinking about it more and more, he's just pretty bad. Good villains? I'm kind of going to put Sandman in there. Because, okay, even though a lot of people's issues is the fact that there are just too many villains, Sandman is one of the villains that I personally felt he didn't have to be in the movie. But, in the context of Spider-Man 3, he was kind of a good villain. He was, I guess in a way, he was just misguided. Because, you know, the, the dumb thing about Sandman is that the, the whole retcon that he killed Uncle Ben. That was the retcon that they gave the whole trilogy, which was really stupid in and of itself. And, you know, Flint Marco, he just gets into an accident and he becomes sand. Literally becomes sand. So, he doesn't become a villain where he's like, oh yeah, you know, I can steal things because I can. You know, I, I want to have a big score. It's the fact that he does it for his daughter. You know, so like his, his motivations is kind of justified. You know, his reasonings for being a villain is justified. And I guess at the end of the day, you know, I guess it's left ambiguous as to whether he'll continue robbing or if he just, you know, goes off and live his life the way he wants to. But, um, you know, he's one of those villains where you're like, man, dude, I kind of feel for you. I kind of like... I understand why you're doing it, and I low-key kind of support you, but in the context of the story, you're a villain, you kind of got to get stopped. Even though, let's be honest, most of the people were like, wanting him to get the money to, to save his daughter, because she was very sick. But yeah, um, that's about it for Sandman, really. Not to mention, too, that like, he gave Spider-Man one hell of a time. He gave Tobey Maguire Spider-Man one hell of a run. Like, regular punches and kicks don't do shit to him. Technically died. Not really, he just turned to mud. And was presumed dead. All he come back and was like, what's up dude, I'm, I'm, I'm basically immortal. <laughs> Next up we have... The Vulture. Vulture is another one of those villains where you're like, damn dude, I kinda understand where you're coming from. Because he was just a regular construction worker, right? He was just a random guy who, you know, after the Battle of New York, you know, in the first Avengers movie, he, you know, he he got the license to harvest all that stuff and, you know, to clean up, pretty much to get paid to clean up the Avengers mess, right? And what happened? Oh, Tony Stark just hires some government officials to be the ones who clean up the mess and to get paid for it. So when I saw the line, you know, when I heard the line in um, Spider-Man Homecoming, damn, so the ones that are making the mess are now getting paid to clean up for it? It, it, it was like, wow, you know, that's fucking crazy. And Michael Keaton is just perfect for this role, dude. Like, he is, like, at first, you like, the Vulture was kind of seen as, like, a stupid villain. But then when you see this movie, you actually like Vulture. Like, the design, the way how he has the wings, the, the helmet... Like, he's such a, like, they reinvented Vulture and made him sort of relevant with the times and with the situation in the movies to the point where it's like, damn, dude, I kind of like you. Sure, he still suffers from the issues where he's like, man, well, yeah, he still suffers from the issue of, damn, dude, because of Tony Stark, I have to, I have to be a villain now, you know, like, I, I have to do what I do. And... You know, the, the thing about it, too, is that, like, he harvests um, alien tech and sells it to people who are willing to pay money, which is how he affords the house, uh, you know, and he lies to his family, saying, like, he's on a business trip or whatever. And you may be able to argue, saying, oh, well, that's a bad thing, you know, that's what villains do. You don't sell guns and, you know, stealing is wrong. But in the context of, hey, you know, like, we're fucking losing jobs out here because the same people that are fucking... You know, the, the same people that are 
causing damage and destruction are the ones that are taking jobs away from us and getting paid to clean it up themselves, that's not right. And when Peter confronts him and he says, how could you do this, you know? Uh, like stealing and stealing and selling weapons is wrong. He make like Vulture makes a pretty good argument. Like Adrian Toomes makes a, a good argument where he's like, "How do you think Tony afford that 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 tower? How he affords all the fancy suits? Because he made profit off of war, you know. And sure, you know that's not the case anymore. He shuts down the, the weapons department, but it's like they never really talk about how Tony makes his money anymore." So sure, it's from inventions and whatnot, but at first it kind of just seemed like he only made money from weapons, you know? And, and the good thing about it too is that like, he he's not such a bad guy. He's just doing what he has to, to make a living, you know, to survive. And so pretty much, once again, he's one of those villains where like, damn, I kind of feel for you. I kind of I kind of want you to succeed, but at the same time, I, I'm conflicted that I don't want you to. And at the very end, he knows who Spider-Man is, he knows it's Peter, and when he had a chance to, to expose him in prison, he kept that secret all to himself. Which I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty... It's, it's pretty honorable. So yeah, Adrian Toomes and the good tier. That's all I have to say for him. Goblin Jr. Goblin Jr. Harry Osborn I is in the good tier for me. Reason why I say this is because for one, he has a good motivation. And his motivation is not because, oh, you know, like he's uh, like, like, you know, he's, he, you know, the, the way how he sees the world is different or it's justified. It's the lack of information. You know, it's, it's the, um, it's not ignorance, but it is, pretty much the lack of knowing what really happened behind the scenes and not to mention too right because the, the thing is Harry isn't always Harry wasn't always a villain he was just a character who hated Spider-Man but just so happened to be Peter's best friend and you know he, he was just like a, a regular person and then when his father died you know Norman Osborn died and he caught Spider-Man just leaving the body out in his freaking living room sofa. He's like, what the fuck did you do? And then he tries to pull the gun out on him. And so it's because of that one interaction where, you know, where he do, he has this hatred for Spider-Man because he just thinks that Spider-Man murdered his dad for no reason. And so it's this, and, and like with the, without the context that, oh, his dad, you know, used the goblin formula and became the Green Goblin and murdered all these people. And, you know, his, his death was, you know, his own doing. Without that information, he's just oblivious to the fact that that ever happened. He's just so blinded by hatred. Or no, he has a reasonable hatred. Because to him, he's just, he, he sees everything. Spider-Man killed his dad? Okay, I hate him now. I hate the guy. I want him dead. It's not something that's like, oh yeah, you know, this this whole story is gonna be concluded in the second episode or in the second movie. This takes like it was started off in the first movie. It doesn't get fully picked up or fully resolved to the very end of the third movie. Where it, where the butler tells him, like, listen, man, like your father was the one who killed him. Like, you know, he was the responsible for his own death. Spider-Man didn't do anything. Uh, you know, and 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 it, it's kind of it's kind of sad when you think about it, because Carrie's whole character development is one track. It, it, it's just one path of him wanting revenge on Spider-Man to kill him if possible. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention Spider-Man too. He finds out that it's Peter, right? Takes off the mask, finds out that it's Peter. And then he's like, oh shit, you know, like, like th this goes against everything I wanted. I had the opportunity to kill him, and now it's, I can't do it, because that's my best friend. You know, and, and like, he's so conflicted. He wants to avenge his father, he sees his father's ghosts and whatnot. And then, you know, freaking, he, he's so conflicted on whether he should do it or not. And then, in Spider-Man 3, he's like, fuck it, dude. I'm gonna take the goblin formula because like you know he finds his father's secret base and whatnot 
and he takes the goblin formula, fights Peter, gets amnesia, they become best friends again. And then, you know, when he gets his memory back, that's when shit hits the fan. He manages to manipulate um, Peter into thinking that Mary Jane was cheating on him. And then, you know, he's like, Peter, I'm the other guy. Uh, fucking gets a grenade chucked at his face. And, 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 and it's crazy too, right? It's crazy too. Because after, Her after everything Harry's been through, you know, the fight, uh, fucking getting a bomb chucked at his face, Peter comes to him begging for his help to save Mary Jane for the third fucking time. And when you turn around and Harry's like, no, you don't deserve my help. You know, like, on one hand, you kind of, you think to yourself, like, at first glance, you're like, man, bro, stop being a bitch and just fucking do it. But then when you watch Spider-Man 3, like, a second time, you're like, no, no, you're right. He fucking doesn't deserve your help. He doesn't deserve it. Because at this point in time, he hasn't been told that his father, you know, is the reason, like, his father was his own reason for dying. Or for was his responsible for his own death. And, you know, even Peter was like, <laughs> look at little Goblin Jr. Gonna cry? And, you know, like, like all, all this shit happened to him. And in the end of the day, he still helps his friend. And, and like, there's this meme going around, I'll see if I can find it, where... Mary Jane's like, oh, you know, like, I want to be with you. I don't care if you're Spider-Man. Like, I, I still love you, Peter. And then in the third movie, she's like, it's not about you. It's about me, though. You know, like, I don't care that you're Spider-Man. You have to support me. And then you and then there's like another panel where you see Peter is like, I'm so sorry for everything that I did. And Harry's like, that doesn't matter. You're my best friend. Like, honestly, Harry had one of the best character arcs. And, and he has to be on, 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 like, the top tier of good villains. He had the best character arc. Out of the whole trilogy. The, the holy trilogy of the Sam Raimi movies. It's not holy, but, you know, that's what it's nicknamed. And it's like, god damn, dude. Now just thinking about it, it's such a good... Such a good character. Anywho, uh, next villain... I'll put Doc Ock over Sandman. And, and here's the thing, right? As much as everyone swears up and down that Spider-Man 2 is the best Spider-Man movie. Which I, at the moment, at, at the time of recording, because uh, No Way Home has not been released yet. Um, just because Spider-Man 2 is the best movie, it doesn't mean that it's perfect. It doesn't mean that it's perfect. And I rewatched all these movies. I've recently rewatched all these movies, so I have all the information fresh in my mind. The thing about Doc Ock, right? You know, he wants to, he, you know, he's doing this science experiment, you know, fusion, where pretty much he harnesses the, the power of a miniature sun, and, you know, it, it's to pretty much give the whole city free, clean energy. He has advanced AI arms to help him with this task, and the problem is, right, you know, he has a chip made out of glass that prevents the AI from taking over him. Science experiment goes wrong, uh, wife dies, and then, you know, he, he he just gets electrocuted. Wakes up, and then he's, and then pretty much, um, the, the robot AI arms are like, damn bro, we know you lost your wife, but you're gonna have to restart that project again. Otto Octavius is like, nah, Peter was right, Peter warned me. I miscalculated. And then, and then, at that point, you would think to yourself, well, okay, you know, that's a wrap. You know, he miscalculated. He, he, how is he going to move on with life? And then this is where you see it. Because the thing about Otto Octavius is that he's a villain where, yes, he is super intelligent. Yes, he is a genius. The problem is he's driven crazy because of the mechanical arms. Sometimes people tend to forget that, that it's the arms that are making him crazy, that make him do what he does. And it's not the other way around. Because there, there has been a panel, there, there has been a comic where they explain that, you know, even though he is a man, he still fights Spider-Man. And we all know Spider-Man has fucking superhuman strength. So you start to wonder, like, bro, how, how are you able to tank these hits? Like, you're just a normal person. And it's later revealed that even though, like, even though, like, Doc Ock has, like, massive concussions because of the punches that he receives, 
it's the it's the AI in his arms that are just dragging his body around, making him still fight, making him still do the villainous things that he does. And so in this case, in the movies, that's what happens. The ins you know, with the AI taking over and you know driving him insane, he's so he's so determined to prove to everyone that he didn't miscalculate, that he was right all along, and that that the only reason why the fucking science experiment failed was because it was just some accident, you know, it, it was just like a hiccup and, you know, a bump in the road. So, even though his motivation is like, okay, you know, go, go and build the science experiment again, you know, does cool stuff, uh, freaking kidnaps Aunt May, the fucking amazing fight scene on the train, uh, the thing is too, why I say Spider-Man 2 isn't perfect, and why uh, Doc Ock isn't on the amazing tier list, is because of the fact that, in all honesty, what was his plan? Like, what was the endgame goal? Because, you know, like, Vulture had an endgame goal, you know? Just sell all the alien tech until he's rich, or until he has enough money to be set for life. Then he's done with the game, you know? Like, he, he can go into retirement, he could just chill with the family. Harry Osborn's was to kill Spider-Man. Finds out that it's Peter. He's gonna help him. He's gonna help him out. He dies. Flint Marcos is just gonna steal money to for enough for his daughter, you know, to get medical treatment, and then that was it. Otto Octavius is to harness a miniature sun, pretty much get radiation, and then just stand there, I guess, for the rest of time. For for the rest of eternity. <laughs> because he he hasn't established a way where as far as the presentation shows there was no establishment that there was a way that the sun can be harnessed without him having to stand there get all that sunburn all that sunburn radiation so it's like there's no field generator there is no like that th there's no team to help him out with that it's just no i'm just gonna stand here hold the sun make sure Make sure the sun doesn't, you know, go nuclear on us. And pretty much that's it. Like, I'm pretty sure you would have gotten cancer by the next day. Like, all he had for protective gear was goggles. And that's about it. Like, ah, yes, my eyes are protected. But my body is absorbing all this radiation in the sunlight. I can't wait to die. <laughs> like, I get it. This is where... Oh, it's just a comic book, you know, don't think too much of it. I, I get that that's where, you know, that's where it comes into play, because there's only so much logic you can have in the uh, the Spider-Man movies, but dude, it's just, it's just like, oh my god, bro. The more you think about it, you're like, uh, you're kind of not making sense here. But that's it for Doc Ock. And finally, for the amazing tier, I have to put the Green Goblin. And I'm not gonna lie. Green Goblin isn't even my favorite villain, but in the context of the of all the live-action Spider-Man movies, right? I don't even know who this guy is, mind you. I don't even know who this guy is. Um, Green Goblin is honestly the best villain, and I don't like the fact that people don't acknowledge that. He's such a menacing villain, and you would think, oh, you know, like, what's his goal? You know, like... You know what, what's his plan and whatnot. But does it? But the character arc of Norman Osborn from going to a regular person to becoming the Green Goblin and eventually dying or getting himself killed—it's just all one tra tragic story. Because it's not Norman Osborn that's doing this; it's the insanity of the of the Goblin serum. Because Norman Osborn was working on a Super Soldier serum, right? Because like that, that's technically in the comics, mostly what what um, is the reason for the Goblin formula. Because they were trying to recreate the Super Soldier Serum. In one way, shape, or form, Captain America is just inspired. Like because he's the only person to successfully get the Super Soldier Serum without any side effects. Um, there have been many scientists decades afterwards that have been trying to re you know recreate the serum, and Norman Osborn was one of them. So in the movies, you know, the military wants the, the superhuman enhanced serum. And, you know, Norman's like, oh, yes, you know, we had one little accident, but the, the serum is perfect. It's 
completely good for human trials. Until, oh, you know, his, you know, some, some other dude was like, we're gonna need to take it back to formula. And Norman's like, back to formula? Motherfucker, what? What? So, you know, he, he's competing with another corporation, with another company, to make this, you know, to make this serum. So, in a desperate act, he uses the serum on himself because the side effects of the serum is like, oh, uh, insanity, violence, and, you know, and delusion. Th those were the side effects of the goblin serum. So, it pretty much is an explanation as to why he does w what he does. You know, because at the end of the day, when he takes the goblin serum, he becomes insane. He becomes very violent to the point where, you know, he, he it's almost like he developed a different personality, a different persona, which I think is also another side effect. So, like, not only that, but pretty much um, it, it's, it's sort of like the Jackal and Hyde sort of character where one is completely oblivious to what happens while there is the other side, the darker side of that same character that's doing everything, you know, that's doing the murders and doing everything that benefits um his his other counterpart and the thing about it too is that like you know there are just so many iconic moments well at the freaking festival where he throws that in that disintegrating bomb and like all the corporate members just fucking you know fucking evaporate into skeletons and whatnot um what else the the fact that he even figures out who spider-man is right because I will admit he does have a little dumb moments, but you can kind of ex you can kind of excuse that with the insanity part of the serum, where he's like, "Oh, you know what? New York is a place where guess what? A bunch of average schmucks, average schmucks every single day, can be used to lift us up to the realm of gods. You know, we can create so much stuff. We can be such a god to these people." Or, you know, you could be dumb and fight me and, you know, countless innocent civilians are going to die. And not to mention, he has one of the most iconic lines that is being referenced heavily because of No Way Home. And the line goes, I chose my path, you chose the way of the hero. And they found you amusing for a while, the people of this city. But the one thing they love more than a hero is to see a hero fail, fall. I try. In spite of everything you've done for them, eventually they will hate you. Why bother? And and it's like, when you hear that line, you're like, man, they're not gonna hate superheroes. But then in Spider-Man's case, you know that that becomes the that becomes reality. You know he gets wanted by the Daily Bugle, and in the most recent case for uh, Spider-Man: Far From Home, you know the whole world is after him now. The whole world is after him. After everything that he's done, after he brought back half the universe, after he stopped the quote-unquote elementals and Mysterio and Vulture, like, people just don't care. Once he's branded as a villain, oh, that's it. They they hate him now. And so, uh, what else? He figures out who Peter is in, you know, the Sam Raimi movies because uh, Spider-Man got a cut on his arm. You know, he got a cut on his arm and, you know, they have Thanksgiving later. And so when he saw Peter with that same cut, he's like, oh, oh, you're, you're Spider-Man. Okay. But again, that's the goblin part of him talking. Norman Osborn doesn't want to hurt Peter, but the goblin part of his, of his personality just starts taking over more and more. And guess what? Attacks Aunt May. And then he knows who Peter is and he's the one who kidnaps Mary Jane and gives Spider-Man a choice. Either save kids or save Mary Jane. Either way, one's gonna die. Spoiler alert, nobody dies. You know, those the, you know th those two groups don't die. But pretty much, not to mention, he gave Spider-Man such a fucking gruesome fight. Oh my god. Like, like, Peter took a grenade to the face, and he didn't get scarred like Harry did. But my lord, he got that ass beat. And the best part about it, too, is that at the very end, when when peter figures out when he finally finds out that you know norman osborne is the green goblin he's like oh my god 
you killed all those people. You tried to kill Mary Jean and Aunt May. He's like, I, di I didn't do it, man. It's it's the goblin serum. It, that thing is trying to freaking kill me. Like, it, I, it, it's making me do things I don't want to do. I don't want to hurt you. I've been like a father to you. Please be a son like me and help me. And Peter is like, damn. I feel so bad for you. And then you and then you think to yourself, oh, snap, that really is Norman. Like, holy shit. Like, is this where it's going to end? And it turns out, no. That was just the whole goblin serum just talking. Talking that entire time. The insanity part of him, you know, playing possum to try and get and try trying to kill Spider-Man. I guess in some way he was trying to kill himself along with Spider-Man because those blades were sharp enough to fucking pierce through a brick wall. And at the very end of the day, um at the end of at the end of the day, he stabs himself, right? In the balls, mind you. And his dying words are, um, Peter, don't tell Harry. Because he doesn't want his son to find out that he's become a monster. Those were his dying words. And, you know, it, it, it kind of sucks. Because he was such an amazing character, but nobody really talks about him like that. And a side note, you know Green, you, you know Norman Osborn was such a big deal when he started up, when he started showing up in sequels. And he was already dead. So it's like, okay then. <laughs> but yeah, that about does it. That is my tier list. Um, once again, I'm not reviewing these characters because uh, this dude was irrelevant. Uh, Mac Gargan, you only showed up for like two minutes max, two to five minutes maximum, because you got hit by a car once again. And uh, elect uh, shocker. Uh, I, I mean, sure, you showed up for more than, like, five minutes, but you really didn't do anything to establish that you're the shocker. You just showed up, got webbed up, and then, okay, you're in prison. So, yeah. Uh, that about does it. So, that about does it. Uh, let me know what you guys rank the villains. And if you liked the video, please leave a like, uh, subscribe to the channel, and, yeah, I'll just see you guys in the next video.